Hello everyone, this is our science teacher Tim Martin, and in this video we're going to be talking about movement in the Earth's atmosphere and how that leads to global winds. Now, if you don't remember, I'd really encourage you to go back to the previous video that talked about energy in the Earth's atmosphere and look once again at the convection cycle. In this image demonstrating convection, we see a very bright light. The light is emitting energy in the form of light and through radiation, it is hitting the black can, where it warms the black can, in turn warms the water. When we say the water warms, really what we're talking about is that atoms and molecules are moving faster. When they move faster, they expand and take up more space, becoming less dense, causing them to float. On the other side, the reverse is happening near the ice. A similar thing happens in the Earth's atmosphere. In fact, it is true that most of the energy that we get ultimately comes from the sun. Now, as we discussed, solar energy heats the surface of the land. As the land warms up, so too does the air, causing the air to expand and rise. Now, the air that's rising, we aren't left with a hole where there's no air. Other air comes in to replace it. We commonly refer to that as wind. The air that's risen eventually will travel towards the poles, and at the poles, of course, we know that it is much cooler, and the cooling air should sink and complete our convection cycle traveling around from the poles to the equator. Ultimately, what we're saying is cool air sinking at the poles will migrate across the surface of the Earth till it reaches the lower latitudes or the tropical regions where the solar energy heats it it warms and rises and completes a convection cycle. If you understand this, we're part way there. Unfortunately, that's not how the whole system works. If we understand this system and we understand this model, we can make the greater complexities. So let's figure out what's really going on. Why doesn't this model work? So, because the Earth rotates, ultimately, what's going to seem to happen is the surface winds will get bent. This again is a model that's slightly imperfect, so it's not quite right. It's helpful to understand this in the process of trying to understand how air does move in our atmosphere. So, really understanding how the air moves, I'd encourage you to grab a blank piece of paper and follow along. Those of you who are in my class, we will be assessed on this, so you'll want to get out and practice this and draw it several times. Let's start out drawing a big circle. This is going to represent the Earth. Now, let's indicate a few important points. So I'm going to draw dotted lines here to represent lines of latitude. In this case, I'll have the equator and a line approximately at 30 degrees latitude, lines at 60 degrees latitude. These are important, meteorologically speaking. Now, as we discussed earlier, most of our energy does come from the sun. Remember, the sun heats the surface of the earth, and the earth heats the air. That causes the air near the equator, or the tropical air, to rise. As it rises, it doesn't take long before it cools, and it turns out we have an area of sinking air around 30 degrees. So we have these small convection cells, referred to as Hadley cells, that circulate between zero degrees latitude and 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south latitude. Similarly, the air near the poles is also much cooler, and so we do see sinking air at the poles. As the air hits the ground and travels around the surface, it doesn't take long before it warms, and we'll see another cell it's between 60 degrees and 90 degrees at the poles. These are referred to as the polar convection cells. It may not come as too much of a surprise that there is a third cell that is caught in between the Hadley cell from 0 to 30 and the polar cell from 60 to 90. This is referred to as the feral cell, another convection cell that's caught between the ones at the high latitudes and the one at the low latitudes.
So it turns out, instead of just a convection cell in the northern and southern hemisphere, there are three in the north and three in the south. Now, it's also worth noting that every place we have descending or sinking air, that generates a zone of high pressure at the surface of the Earth. Likewise, every place there is rising air, we'll see a generalized area of low pressure. And those low pressure zones are located approximately at 60 degrees and zero degrees latitude. Let's talk a little more about the surface winds though. If we take a look at the red arrow, the bottom of this zone between 30 degrees and zero degrees, we'll see that it actually gets bent. This bending is due to the rotation of the Earth, or often referred to as the Coriolis effect. We always name winds where they come from, so it turns out we see that the winds in this zone are referred to as the Northeast trade winds. Those of you who've studied some history will understand that the European explorers coming to the New World often ended up in Florida or the Caribbean. The reason why is they followed the trade winds. There are also trade winds in the Southern Hemisphere coming out of the Southeast, so these are called the Southeast trade winds. Between 30 degrees and 60 degrees, again, we see the winds being bent in a clockwise direction away from the high pressure zone. And these winds are generally trending out of the west, and so they're referred to as the westerlies. Again, the early explorers, when they went from the Americas back to Europe, they sailed up the coast until they picked up the westerlies, and the westerlies carried them back to Europe. There are also westerlies that occur in the southern hemisphere between 30 degrees and 60 degrees latitude. Finally, up in the extreme polar regions, we'll see the polar easterlies. These winds are the winds descending at the pole, migrating down to the area of approximately 60 degrees latitude. Again, we have polar easterlies in both the northern and southern hemispheres. Now, you may need to hit pause to catch up with all of these, but it's also important that we understand there are important zones of areas between the wind. Let's specifically take a look what's going on at zero degrees latitude. You'll notice that there's winds that come from the north, there are winds that come from the south, but right around the equator, the air is rising. This is an area of very little surface wind, referred to as the doldrums. Occasionally, it's also referred to as the intertropical convergence zone. We'll just abbreviate that as ITCZ. This is an area between the tropics where the winds converge. Again, this is characterized by an area with very little surface wind. Similarly, let's take a look at what happens at 30 degrees latitude. In general, we see the air sinking and then diverging from this point. This area is known as the horse latitudes. There are horse latitudes in both the northern and southern hemispheres around 30 degrees. This is a zone of sinking air and also very little surface winds. This area was named the horse latitudes, again, due to the early explorers who were traveling to the Americas with a cargo of horses. When they were caught in this zone of little or no wind, the horses were the first to go overboard when the water supplies were running out. At the 60 degree zone in the northern hemisphere, we have the area called the polar front. This is a location that we will explore much more as we go on further into meteorology, but there is a polar front at 60 degrees north, also a polar front at 60 degrees south latitude. Now finally, at the poles, we have the polar high. This is the area where there's sinking air, and again, we'll see a polar high at 90 degrees north and at the South Pole at 90 degrees south. So this completes our global wind diagram. You'll want to be familiar with this because understanding this will help us with basic weather forecasting for many locations around the world.
will also understand quite a bit about climate and various weather patterns if we understand this diagram. I'd like to look at this one more time with just a little fancier version of the diagram. This really is the same thing, but I want to understand that these zones of circulating air are actually tubes where you can imagine a donut shape of air that's circulating around, rising at the equator, sinking around 30 degrees latitude, rising at 60 degrees, and again sinking at 90 degrees. So we have the cutaway version here in the northern hemisphere and a partial cutaway in the southern hemisphere where we can see that we have these zones of rising and sinking air. And those zones are very influential in our weather and climate. Thanks for watching, and in the next video, we'll take a look at some other ways that we see wind circulating air and energy around our planet.